You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. They will not control us. We will be victorious. So come on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How you doing today? We got into that one. <laughs> you are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. Yes, because we love Muse. They're, yeah. We, we both agree they're a great band. <laughs> I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Yeah, my dad got Aretha Franklin. Yeah, she's pretty sweet, actually. She is pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. So. Respect. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're back with another deck tech for an upcoming Game Nights episode that's coming out January 25th. Last time, we talked about Rakdos with uh, the Scourge Diva. What's her name Judith. again? Judith. Judith. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, Judith. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't forget her name. And uh, we're doing something a little different. We're doing the deck text before the episode comes out. Um, let us know what you guys think about it in the comments. Uh, I, I actually like this because you guys see spoilers and people start making decks around before the sets come out. So yeah, it always felt before like we were talking about a deck, but it was like a month after everybody's seen the card yeah. because we had to wait till games nights came out and then talk about it. I also think like watching the episode and knowing like what each deck's trying to do, or we're not gonna be able to do all the decks before the episode comes out because it's coming out on uh, January 25th. Yeah. But at least you'll know what a couple of the decks are trying to do. And you know, obviously we do a quick deck deck tech deck breakdown in the Game Nights episode, but it's like 90 seconds. Yeah. So if you want, you know, more like an hour, well, here you are. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I decided to do something a little bit different with the Lavinia deck tech today. We're gonna talk about the deck as it appears on the show and its current form as well as two adjacent ways that you might want to take it. Um, and we'll talk about exactly why I did that in a bit. But before we get there, a lot of cards we're going to be talking about today, a lot of different ways to build this deck that satisfy, I believe, all kinds of players. You should head on over to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. You're going to be buying cards anyway. Why not now suit them up with the perfect cards to add from Card Kingdom with fast shipping, great customer service. We shared a really nice story last week about them, and they do live up to that name. Yeah, they have great customer service. And speaking of suiting up your deck, you know, you might want to suit it up, if it's Lavinia, in Azorius sleeves. Or the or, Azorius deck box. Oh, yeah, or with the Azorius deck box or the Hallowed Fountain playmat. They have that so that all your stuff is matching. Ultra Pro really does make the best uh, product in the business that is going to protect your stuff. And it's really important that you have good card sleeves because yeah. you know you might have an expensive card or two in the deck and you don't want anything to happen to it so ultra pro always killing it always making higher and higher quality things this is so cool man i'm glad i can always keep my azorius deck in the azorius deck box it, it also makes it easier when you're like with <laughs> you don't <laughs> have to open each deck to like look at it you're like yeah. that's the lavinia one that's the judith one right. this is the taste of one you can just look at it from the outside of the box so uh, the last way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You can contribute right to us for game nights, extra turns, this podcast. Also, at a certain level, you get access to the Discord server, which is like a chat server. Jimmy mm -hmm. and I are hanging out on all the time. It's fun to chat with all of our patrons and answer questions or just brew Brewing decks. Cards, yeah. yeah, that's a lot of fun. And, and I've had the Discord help me with some of the stuff we've talked about on the episodes as far yeah. as like talking about cards and cards people think are good or they they're excited about. They help me with this about. deck as well. Yeah, so if you want to be a part of that entire community, patreon.com slash command zone. And one other thing that patrons get is we call out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to... Ferdinand Baumgarten. What I, happened I, to your I, contribution? I was going to say Fernando, and then I was like, realized <laughs> I was wrong. Sorry, Ferdinand. Ferdinand Baumgarten. I yeah. will say that... Uh, by myself rather than in unison because I messed it up. I want to say what for, is, Fernando. You know, Fernand, you rock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, wow. That's the first time I haven't said it. Ferdinand, you rock. Ah, there you go. Jimmy, um, me to it. Fernand actually switched his pledge from $1 to $2, which means that he has access to the Discord. Um, and this month, I think we're going to be doing a little community thing where we're going to decide the best songs that fit each guild. Oh. Yeah, so like across the history of music, like what is the Rakto song, you know? So clearly that is Aretha Franklin's <laughs> R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I think and we're more in the hard rock <laughs> slash maybe death metal kind of thing, you know what I is mean? Is Azorius, see, Azorius, it can't be... Uh, uprising by Muse, because in general, the Azorius right. are not rebellious. It's just Lavinia that is, right? At this point, I yeah. would believe so. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the deck tech. Today, we are talking about Lavinia Azorius Renegade. 
She's blue-white, a legendary creature human soldier 2-2. Two, two. Each opponent can't cast non-creature spells with converted mana cost greater than the number of lands that player controls. And whenever an opponent casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell. So she doesn't seem amazing for EDH, all things considered, but she does actually have a lot of ways that slow people down, I think, in actually pretty effective ways, which is if someone's ramping out crazy and they're going to cast big non-creature spells, you can stop them. Yeah, um, she definitely does hose certain decks too, just incidentally. Yeah. Narsets, Jaleva's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Stops all zero casting cost things, so like packs of whatever, Mana Crypt. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they probably cast their Mana Crypt before Lavinia came out, but at the same time, Mana Crypt's giving you two extra mana, but you can't really cast a five drop on turn three with a Mana Crypt if Lavinia's out. Yeah. Unless it's a creature spell. And the thing about this deck for me is I felt that it was actually really hard to get creative in the way that I built it because a lot of blue-white is just kind of lends itself to, and this deck and this commander lends itself to a very specific thing, which is stop people from doing stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a lot of synergy with Lavinia, but a lot of it's kind of mean or yeah. really mean, like the knowledge pool thing. Uh, yeah. That's just like uh, no one can cast spells like... Uh, it's, uh, it's not something everybody wants to do. Right. So I wanted to do something that was still powerful, still fun to pilot, but also wouldn't be, you know, and we talked about this, like, I guess politically, people really don't like full lockdown stasis decks because it kind of stops people. It doesn't really give other players a chance sometimes. Right. And that is um, sort of one of the things I ran up against while making this deck. So that's why we're later on, we're going to talk about other ways to build it that I think could be fun if you wanted to build around a commander like this, but without making people, uh, potentially making things a little dicey at the table. Yeah, because if you do the full-on stacks, and you went a little bit, but not full-on, mm -hmm. uh, but if you went full-on stacks, which I think is probably the most powerful way to build Lavinia, you might win a game or two with that deck, but pretty soon you're going to be emailing us, and you're going to be asking the famous question, why is my playgroup killing me, me first, first every yeah. single game? Why well, do they not want to play with me anymore? Yeah, <laughs> well, that's probably because uh, you played that Lavinia deck too yeah. much. But the strategy and goal of this deck is to establish comfort and safety, make sure you're safe and you're good to go, establish a grip in your hand, a launch a bunch of cards you can win with and take it all down at once. Because if anything, the worst part about stacks is being like, it's stacks time, 10 turns later. Is it still stacks time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are you gonna win? I'll figure something yeah, out. Yeah, we'll get there. I'm just, <laughs> I, I gotta draw into my win con. No, I'd rather get that ready and then do it very quickly so that it's not too much of a pain for everyone else. But to do that, it means you're gonna need some elements of stacks. And uh, well, here we go. The greatest art in all of magic. Yeah. It, it's almost like it came from Amon Ket, you know, like this guy over yeah, here. It is. I, I, I do think it's one of the best arts of all time. Stasis. One in the blue for an enchantment. Players do not get an untap phase, uh, and it has a upkeep cost of blue. Otherwise, you destroy stasis. Which was supposed to sort of keep it in check because if no one's untapping, eventually you can't pay the blue. Right. I mean, obviously you can play lands and they come into play untapped, mm -hmm. uh, which can keep stasis alive for a while. But there are various ways, of course, to keep stasis alive forever. But often you don't need to just keep it up indefinitely. You just get into a good position, lock everybody down for two or three turns, and that lets and you... And that's all you need, yeah. yeah. Especially in a deck that's saying, like, it's harder, it's already difficult for you to cast things. Mm-hmm. Well, now you have no untap step, so you don't get any new mana. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so a stasis is probably the roughest card to get down early in, in this deck by all by far, because it is the only thing that really says you don't get to untap. Uh, not to jump ahead, but this is there's a new card from Ravnica Allegiance that you did put in the deck that mm -hmm. combos very, very well with stasis. Yes. So it's Smothering Tithe, and we talked about this on our set review if you can get Smothering Tithe out, because it is a card that's three and a white, and it says whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two mana. If they don't, you create a treasure token artifact that says tap and sack it to add one mana of any color. So if you get this out and then cast Stasis, well, then it comes to my turn. I draw a card. I did, wasn't able to untap, so I have no mana to pay. So... Jimmy gets a treasure token. Well, the treasure token can pay the upkeep on stasis. Yep. And you're going to gain a couple extra treasure from the other players mm -hmm. on each turn. And that's the kind of thing that with stasis just makes it like nearly impossible to break out of. Yeah, not fun. Yeah. But it's powerful. Super powerful. Uh, another one. And these next two cards are very similar. Can I just read yeah, at the same yeah, time? Yeah, I feel like these are JLK favorites, by the way. Yeah. So Blind Obedience and Frozen Ether. Blind Obedience is one and a white for an enchantment. Frozen Ether is three and a blue for an enchantment. They basically make your opponent's stuff come into play tapped. So Frozen Ether is artifacts, creatures, and lands from your <laughs> opponents come to play tapped. Uh, with Stasis out, it's brutal. But it's surprisingly brutal 
just by itself. By itself, yeah. Lands coming into play tapped is pretty brutal. There, you you make all of your opponent's lands into guild gates, kind of, mm-hmm. which is not great because they're just playing a turn behind you the whole game. And then blind obedience is only artifacts and creatures your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped, but it also has extort. So all of the spells you cast, you can pay a white, in this case only a white, mm-hmm. but uh, a white or a black in addition to this cost of the spell, basically, and you drain everybody for one. Everybody takes one damage, and you gain that much, that life. much life. I want to make a rules thing, because we always get, get this, this when we talk about always, extort. Yeah. Okay, extort has the hybrid black-white mana symbol in its reminder text. I know a lot of people, they go, you can't play that unless you have black and white in your deck. That's not true, because extort is the exception to the rule, because reminder text does not add to the color identity of the card. It's reminder text. Yep. Rules text does. So the hybrid mana symbol in extort, the mechanic extort, doesn't change the color identity of the card. It doesn't affect it. So right. in this case, Blind Obedience is a mono white card. Yeah. Now, if it said extort colon and it said uh, you may pay a hybrid mana every time a card enters the battlefield, if you do do this effect, then it would be considered a black white card. I know it's confusing. Just take our word for it. Extort is not part of color identity yeah so if it's a white card with extort on it you can play it in a white deck yep. um another reason i like frozen ether is it kind of resets the turn order yeah it lets you be the first player in a lot of ways which is really powerful and what we learned the first player actually has like a six percent better chance to win the game so if you can steal turn one you just increase your win percentage yeah. by a lot i'll take those odds uh next up we got grand arbiter augustine the fourth two a white and a blue for a two three legendary creature human advisor this card is nuts it's, it was on our most hated commander list for DJ and I, for sure. Yeah. It's not the commander in this case. It's still one of my most hated in the 99 cards, It's too. absurd. <laughs> so for you, the person that casts it, white spells and blue spells you cast cost one less to cast. So if it's a white and a so blue like spell, it costs two less. Yeah. Ugh. And spells your opponent cast cost one more to cast. So all spells. It's, it's just very powerful. It very quickly turns into, you know, this combined with a frozen ether or a blind obedience means now that they're two turns behind. And that's sort of what I mean by uh, setting up a safety net, is you need to make sure that you're far enough ahead that if everyone turns on you at the same time, you still are able to get out of it. I mean, you just slow, you put your opponents into molasses. They're just moving so (laughs) slow, right? And with Lavinia, it becomes a a headache to cast stuff because you can't cast non-creature spells that cost more than the amount of lands you have in play. And then everything you're casting costs one more. I do want to say that Lavinia... Um, cares about the CMC of this spell, so mm-hmm. the additional one mana from Grand Arbiter won't affect it. Affect it. So, like, yeah. let's say you have it's five. Just you, let's say you have five lands in play and a Signet, and you go to play a five drop. Grand Arbiter's out, so it costs six. Lavinia still allows it. Yeah, because you're looking for five. Well, yeah. five drop in terms of a non-creature spell. Right, right, right. Yeah. Whoa! Nice. Th- see, that it's one was... it hit me. That one hit me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. Another way you have to be safe is in combat. So we have cards that we've talked a lot about here. Um, Magus of the Moat. It's the realistic way to play Moat in Commander. <laughs> Unless you have six hundred dollars. <laughs> Two whatever. white white for a zero three human wizard creatures without flying can't attack. Can't attack anybody. Can't attack. Just can't do anything. Um, obviously, you have some flyers in this in this deck as well. But just a good card to just make sure you're not being run over by a million tokens or whatever else it is. Speaking of tokens. Yes. These next two cards work good against them. Propaganda and Ghostly Prison. I don't think there there may be no two cards we've talked about more on the show except for Vidal Knorri, other than these two here. Prophet of Krufix in the day. Yeah, in the uh, the good old days. <laughs> um, both of these cost two and then either white or blue, and they basically tax your opponent for trying to attack you. Um, creatures can't attack you unless the controller plays two for each creature. He or she controls that's attacking you. So... It makes it very hard for people to attack you. If you're already slowly choking their mana in some small way, Lavinia's already out. You know, it's not the full stasis lockdown. It's not brutal. People can still play. You're just setting them a slightly further behind so that you can establish your comfort on the table before taking decisive action. It also often makes your opponent attack a different opponent yeah. than, your, than you. And a lot of players are like, well, once you've hit somebody, it's better to keep hitting the same person rather than make another person mad at you. Right. So it can just be enough deflection. They're very powerful cards. Yeah. Uh, the last one is Platinum Angel. Seven mana for a 4-4 four, four flyer. It says you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. So basically until they kill this thing... You could be at negative a yeah. billion life or I guess zero life, but you still wouldn't die. Yeah. Um, just I, I thought that was just another interesting... That's sort of one of my flex cards. I've never really gotten to play it much in Commander, so I wanted to see how it worked. Finally, the last category for safety would be the counterspell category and 
you know, I like counter spells. I've seen this them is, win so many games. This next one is gone up and up. I'm glad you included it because I am including it more and more these days. Yeah. I was going to say, though, because I love counter spells, but I also don't love always having to pay, play just counter spells. Right. Um, so Insidious Will is one of those cards that lets you get a lot of flexibility out of something. Two blue blue, and it's an instant. You can choose one, counter target spell, or you may choose new targets for target spell, or copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So I'm going to take that Electro Dominance and redo it myself. You can fork it, you can steal it, or you can just counter it. Yeah, and this is like three cards that in the past was like, man, do I play Misdirection in my deck? Ah, probably not. And Insidious Will does all of that and also leaves you with the ability to counter just a straight-up spell if you need it. So you get a ton of flexibility with it. It's never a feel-bad in your hand. You feel like you're in control when you have something like this. This next one, are you playing it just to like laugh in people's faces because when Lavinia's out, they can't play this card? Maybe. It's Pact of Negation. It's zero mana for an instant. says counter-target spell. At the beginning of your next upkeep, pay three blue-blue. If you don't, you lose the game. So again, with Lavinia out, your opponents can't cast spells if if they didn't pay mana for it. Mm -hmm. You can, though. Yeah, so Pact good. of Negation for zero is good. And then, you know, don't forget to pay the upkeep. Otherwise, you lose. Unless Platinum Angel's out. Yeah, and honestly, any time... Yeah, that's actually really funny. Any <laughs> Pact of Negation, Platinum Angel, pass. <laughs> Anytime you are able to cast something for zero mana, it's incredibly powerful. Because it, that's the thing. People are going to be looking for openings. Like, okay, finally, he's tapped out. He's weak. Let's do something. And you've got Pact of Negation or a Force of Will type effect. You are good to go. Yep. Or if you just leave up only white mana and cast Teferi's Protection. Two and a white. Instant until your next turn, your life total can't change. And you have protection from everything. All permanents you control phase out. And then you exile the spell. So phasing means that all your uh, permanents are treated like they don't exist. And then they phase in before your next untap step. Yeah. Um, this... I you know I put this in the counter spell category because technically it can counter a spell if That's someone's true. targeting like you Iconic or Rift. something. Yeah, you'd be like, nope, see ya. <laughs> the nice thing is it still affects everyone else. Yeah. So I, I, the card has just gone up and up and up in my book. It's really powerful. Uh, it's been played on game nights on the uh, Guilds of Ravnica episode. Actually, we did a whole thing. There was a complicated stack and Teferi's protection factored pretty heavily into it. Okay, the next category is get the grip. When I say grip, it means your hand. I don't know if that's a, a common grip of name. cards. A grip of cards, yeah. right? So this is how to set stuff up. Smothering tithe. This was is my one favorite card. category, by the way, because you're drawing a lot of cards. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, Smothering tithe was a card that we uh, have from the upcoming set. So is precognitive perception. Three blue blue for an instant, and you can draw three cards. However, if you cast this spell during your main phase, you instead scry three, then draw three cards. So again, a flexible card draw spell. I wanted to try to put some cards from Ravnica Allegiance in there and. When you, again, are putting people so far behind, sometimes you will have the freedom to addendum a card and not have to worry about, oh, I have to cast it on someone's end step. And hey, if you have enough mana, maybe you can go off with those cards this turn too. Scry three, draw three is way better than uh, just draw three. Yeah. So if you can pull that off, you want to. That's like dig through time almost. You're going to get six cards deep. Yeah, you get so, to look at a lot of stuff and yeah, decide what you want. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, the next one is Tamiyo the Moon Sage. Three blue blue for a four mana Planeswalker, Tamios, plus one, tap target permanent. It doesn't untap during its controller's ne next untap step. So it's removal. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is negative two. Draw a card for each tapped creature target player controls. Pretty good with blind obedience and those things or stasis. Or if someone's just trying to kill you and you don't, you know, they're just yeah. tapping all their stuff. Yeah. And then her uh, minus eight is you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size and whenever a card is put into your graveyard from anywhere you may return it to your hand. The one thing I'll say about ultimates in a deck that has stasis and things like that in it is that your chance of getting there are a lot higher. Yeah. Because stasis stops an untap step, but it doesn't stop planeswalkers because they don't care about tapping and untapping, so they still get to activate every turn. So stasis with planeswalkers is very powerful. Also just Grand Arbiter and planeswalkers because slowing down your op opponents and making it so it's hard for them to affect your stuff mm -hmm. tends to make planeswalkers a little bit better. So Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> next up, a combination of two cards. Uh, basically, one card can cast the other card. Yeah. <laughs> the card that it's casting is Sphinx's Revelation. It's X, white, blue, blue. It's an instant, and it says you gain X life and draw X cards. This card is the ridiculous. The card that is printed, that essentially has Sphinx of his Re Revelation printed on it, is Azor the Lawbringer. Two white, white, blue, blue for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature Sphinx with flying. When Azor the Lawbringer enters the battlefield, each opponent can't cast instant or sorcery spells during that player's next turn. 
So you basically can't get rid of it unless you are using some sort of creature based removal. And whenever Azor attacks, you may pay Sphinx's Revelation cost. And then if you do, you gain X life and draw X cards. So I really like Azor. It's also a win condition because sometimes just hitting someone in the air for six is amazing. And then you're able to also refill your grip and refill your life as a result. Um, I think in a deck like this, life gain is actually pretty important because people will be trying to target you and the most common way to kill someone in Magic is by just taking their life total from 40 to 0. So both these cards, incidentally, very powerful and they help you establish your grip as well as potentially set up a win condition. Yeah, Sphinx's Revelation, just a really good card. Um, and then the last card on this list of sort of refilling your hand is Teleria West. This card we probably haven't talked about enough. It's a land. Yeah. It comes into play tapped. It can tap for blue mana. But the important thing is it has transmute. So for one blue blue, you discard this card and then search your library for a card with converted mana cost zero and then reveal it and put it into your hand and then shuffle your library. And you can play this only as a sorcery. So transmute is on a lot of cards. And this one is just a land that has it, which means it fills a land slot in your deck. And it's also like a tutor for zero mana costed things, which are like lands or mana crypts. Or... Counter spells like Pact and Negation. Yep. So being able to say, okay, this is white and blue, right? You're not you don't you have access to some tutors, but Teleria West also lets you get things that you may not be able to search out, um, or it just gives you another option. Sometimes you play it as a land, other times you grab something you really need. It's actually really great just to get Mana Crypt because yeah, it's, it's three mana to get you know basically a Soul Ring. It makes it kind of cost one mana to do mm -hmm, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, okay, so now that you've gotten the grip, it's time to begin the nuclear countdown slash establish your win conditions. Um, <laughs> and there are a few cards. This sort of blends in with the next category, which is raise the hammer um, before you bring it down. And the first card on this list is blatant thievery. So oh, four blue, blue, blue sorcery for each opponent. Gain control of target permanent that player controls. Target permanent. Yeah, seven mana, you can just steal three things on the table if you're playing with four players. It's pretty good. You can get any permanent you want. Um, usually the things that are stopping you or the thing that's like, this is my trump card against your deck. Be like, eh, it's mine now. I was playing the other day and someone blatant thievery my homeward path. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they also got two other sweet things out of the deck. I was right? just like, because uh, I had just used it the turn before. Oh, wow. And then, you know, yeah. Oh, wow. That, that wow, was a wow, good wow. one. I, I thought the irony level of that play was that very is actually high. amazing yeah uh luminarch ascension is the next one here's a game winner it's uh one in a white for an enchantment at the beginning of each opponent's end step if you didn't did not lose life this turn you put a quest counter on luminarch ascension and then you pay one and a white and you create a four four white angel creature token with flying you can activate this ability only if this uh luminarch ascension has four or more quest counters on it so this can tick up to three with one rotation of the table, and then after it gets to four quest counters on it, it's two mana for a four four flyer. Yeah, instant speed. Instant speed, and it doesn't t like you Stop. can. Yeah, yeah, if I have eight mana, I get four angels. Like it's this card is crazy, crazy powerful, especially in stasis type, Staxy, frozen ether decks where it's like your opponent sees it, but you're slowing down their ability to like. Do yeah. stuff in time. Like if everything they're doing takes an extra turn to happen, Numenarch Ascension is so much better. And it also forces their hand to be like, well, we have to start attacking you now. And if they do, then let's say, sure, I'll take damage because you have to pay for propaganda. You're slowing them down even, even further. More. Yeah. So it just creates another threat that if you don't deal with it, it will help this player win the game. This next card is funny. This next card is why I made the deck the way I did. It's Azor's <laughs> Elocutors. Three blue, blue, or three hybrid, and then two Azorius hybrids, so three white, blue, or white, blue. Uh, creature human advisor for three, five. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a filibuster counter on Azor's Elocutors. <laughs> then if Azor's Elocutors has five or more filibuster counters on it, you win the game. However, whenever a source deals damage to you, remove a filibuster counter from Azor's Elocutors. So it's like Luminarch Ascension in a way where you're trying to not take damage. Um, and you have to go five upkeeps without taking any damage. But in a deck like this, I thought, you know what? May as well put in a very silly and hard to achieve win condition because, hey, it's fun. And it's also on theme with Lavinia and Azorius. Yep. Yep. It, I don't usually like alternate win conditions, but uh, that would be a funny one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next category. Raise the hammer. So now that you have the things here, the nuclear countdown has begun. You need to tell everyone that the countdown is literally ticking down right now. This is lowering the hammer almost, man. Yeah, I know. That, I was going to say the the raise the hammer, lower the hammer. They're, they all kind of blend together because they sort of all fill each category. So there's time warp and time stretch. Time warp is three blue blue for 
uh, target player gets one extra turn. Time stretch is eight blue blue, so double time warp basically for a target player gets two extra turns. Mm -hmm. These are very, very powerful cards. Time stretch, I don't think I've ever seen a cast where the player didn't win the game. Yeah, two extra turns is very powerful. At a point in the game when you've got a bajillion yeah. mana, you yeah, have at least yeah, yeah. 10 mana, yeah. And then the other card that I've never really seen cast except for one time uh, where the player didn't win is expropriate. Yep. Seven blue blue, everybody votes either time or money. If they vote time, then you get an extra turn. Money, you get one of their permanents. You always <laughs> vote time for yourself, so you always get one extra turn with the coolest stuff that you steal from them. Yeah. It's blatant thievery plus an extra turn if your opponents do it right, and sometimes they do it wrong, and it's blatant thievery plus two extra turns or something. Yeah, you and know. you know, you you say these cards are lowering the hammer, but the thing is, you get the turns, you still have to do something with them. So I think that's why I include them in the raise the hammer. Fair enough. This and the last one, <laughs> oh boy, it's Planner Bridge. It's Paradox mm -hmm. Engine. Good. Uh, it's a six mana legendary artifact. You can pay eight and tap it to search your library for a permanent card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So eight mana to find any card out of your deck. Uh, um, any except permanent. for sorceries and instance, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you could grab a planeswalker. You can basically just establish a way to win the game um, through Planner Bridge pretty quickly. And finally, the way that you really end out the game and you bring it all down. I'm sorry, Josh. I brought these cards to game nights. <laughs> Armageddon. What are you going to do on your extra two turns? Well, how about play the biggest thing you have, float a bunch of mana, and then destroy all lands for three and a white? Yeah. Not much your opponents are going to do. Even if they do get turns after your two extra turns or whatever it is, they are not in a good spot. Uh, cat catastrophe is four white, white. Destroy all lands or all creatures. Creatures destroyed this way cannot be regenerated. So this one's a little nicer. Sometimes you're just doing a board wipe. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> but at least it gives you the option. Um, and then finally, uh, Rest in Peace was more of a meta call where it's one in a white. When it enters the battlefield, exile all cards from all graveyards. And if a card or token we put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile instead. I think that's the one thing I was worried about. It's like, what if someone does something with their graveyard but not their battlefield and they have ways to recur that? So Rest in Peace is just sort of another one of the nail on the coffin effects. Rest in Peace is a card that will just turn off a lot of decks. Yeah. A lot of decks. It's sort of Blood Moon to the graveyard recursion decks so the marins the caridors the right. tons of decks are just playing around with their graveyards it's amazing how rest in peace just kind of shuts off a lot of that stuff so yeah yeah very powerful card so that's basically the game plan of the deck which is set it up be safe get a grip and then tell everyone it's about to happen pretty much and then make it happen the last category I put in here, I don't know if you read this yesterday. It's, the JLK special. It's called the JLK special. So there was a lot of pressure on me coming back. They were like, Jimmy, Jimmy, you got to make sure you win game nights. Josh is winning too much. I was like, all right, whatever. I, we just play. I, I don't really know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> but I knew what everyone was playing before because we all choose our commanders. And I was like, well, you know, these are cards I was looking at in general, but I will definitely include them because I think they're particularly good against the commander that Josh played. <laughs> So it was a bit of a meta call. I didn't know the contents of his deck, but I did know that I wanted to play these cards. And the first one is Imperial Mask. I actually like this card a lot, to be honest. I didn't know you were gunning for me so hard. I wasn't gunning for you. It was more just like, I don't want to get gunned down by you. By the way, happened. Rest in Peace is very good against the uh, Judith deck as well. Yeah. It's, I think Reassembling it's, Skeleton doesn't get to come back if it never hits the graveyard. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so... It was actually interesting because my thought about it was, well, you know what? Josh's commander can do a lot of ping damage and stuff, and I can find ways to get around that. I can I can get rid of key cards. But the thing that I can't stop is infinite. Right. And once that gets going, like, because I'm like, okay, I'll counter one thing. It's like, well, I'll just do an infinite triggers up on top of that. Right. So that was the sort of thing that I was worried most about. So Imperial Mask is four and a white for an enchantment. When Imperial Mask comes into play, if it's not a token, each of your teammates put its, puts a token into play that's a copy of Imperial Mask. So teammates doesn't really matter here but you can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control yep Gives so judith you can't proof. like touch you anymore yeah mm -hmm. um and same with prov spires of order actually this is a flavor f uh call because this is the where the senate for azorius resides nice so you just also happen to work but it's a, a land that taps to add one to my mana pool and for four a white and a blue i can tap it to prevent all damage a source of my choice would deal this turn so that kind of gets rid of yeah, Less good against there. infinite because they can just continue over the top of the trigger. Right. Generally, you would try and maybe yeah. do it on their upkeep before they can, can like maybe play a spell or get the combo going because they need it to be their main phase. Right. The imperial mask is particularly good against Judith because uh, 
black red very bad at dealing with enchantments yeah and i don't have that many creatures in the deck the main thing that i would die to would be like all right jamie i'm gonna take you from 40 to zero like that right uh and finally fumigate three white white destroy our creatures you gain one life for each creature destroyed this way i just thought the incidental life game would be good not just against your deck but also the creature based deck we were playing and the other ones on the table Well, like you said you don't have many creatures so just destroying all creatures and you might as well gain life yeah yeah so that's the deck that Jimmy brought yes. to Game Nights. Again, January 25th. You heard my deck tech last week. This is Jimmy's. I believe that DJ is going to do a deck tech of his Tasa deck on his channel. So oh, keep cool. an eye out for that. Vinny, unfortunately, probably we won't have time to bring his in. So you'll know three of the four decks uh, going into that Game Nights episode. It'll be interesting to hear in the comments, you know, based on hearing my deck, Jimmy's deck, if DJ's comes out, just who you think is going to win how you think this the game's gonna go yeah obviously magic is a game that's hard to predict in a lot of ways you can't always just look at the list but it is fun to sort of you know theory craft beforehand and try mm -hmm. and figure out how you think things are gonna go so we'd love to hear your predictions for how the game's gonna go now we're gonna talk about other ways that you thought about building the deck i don't want people to get confused as right Good this call. is not like actually how we built it it's just other ways he thinks you could or maybe you thought about doing yeah because part way through making this deck i was like man this is getting brutal um originally had a lot more stasis elements in there had back to basics in there um but i was like everyone's playing two colors it's yeah fine. back to basics probably wouldn't have been that bad in that yeah. in that particular meta but i started taking some of those cards out and sort of added a couple of more things i thought were more flavorful or might be a little more fun or interesting to try out sort of in like josh said with the flex slots that you often have in your decks and more recently, I had more time because I had a smaller amount of time to craft the deck right before uh, Game Nights were recorded. But afterwards, I had more time to think about the deck, think about the flavor and all that stuff. And I thought there's two different ways that you could take the deck. One to make it more interactive and one to make it more Vorthosy and in line with the story. So for the first beginning, let's talk about a way to make this deck more interactive. And this sort of plays on the ideas of you are the Azorius Guild, you're political, you want people to make choices and have an, you know, sort of a fair vote. And in that case, you're including cards like Council's Judgment. So it's a will of the council card, one white white. Basically, you everyone starts voting on something to exile. And if it's tied, you actually do more than one yeah. thing. Um, and I like that a lot because it gives other players a chance to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And often in these stasis decks, you're denying people that ability to make choices or even play spells. And in that same line, Conspiracy has been great at doing this. There are the Will of the Council cards, like Council's Judgment, um, Council's Dilemma, like we just saw with Expropriate, Parlay, oh, yeah. which is where everyone flips like the top card of their deck. Join Forces is also uh, something from Commander in the past, where you and an opponent get to choose to sort of help each other out or make things together. So that I thought you could include a lot of those cards if you want to make things a little more quote unquote fair. Doesn't necessarily make it that much less powerful. Um, there's also cards that like uh, shared fate. And this is a card from Mirrodin and it's four in the blue for an enchantment. If a player would draw a card, that player exiles the top card of one of their opponent's libraries face down instead. And each player may look at and play cards that you exiled with shared fate. <laughs> so this is weird. It's very bizarre. Um, the five color player is going to like this the most, but I like this because it's like, you know what? We're all in it together. Oh, right. Because it doesn't say you can spend mana as though it were mana of any right. color. So you have to actually cast the spell for its exact mana cost. But it literally stops everyone on their game plan yeah. because they can no longer draw cards from their deck. It's any time a player would draw a card. So it's really interesting. Um, You're just hoping when people flip your cards, they can't play them so you can play them yeah. later, basically. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I don't know if you actually can play them. I just think it's funny that now that, you know, like if we're really going to be in the Senate together and sort of that flavor or we're all making political decisions together, well, we may as well be doing it for each other's decks too. Um, Factor Fiction is oh, also yeah. just a great card draw card in general, but three in a blue instant, reveal the top five cards of your library and opponent separates those cards into two piles, put one into your hand and the other into your graveyard. I've seen Super so many times card. where Super it's just card. like, he's going off, Factor Fiction, Two piles, one with five cards, one with zero yeah. cards. You can have them all. Stop him. Yeah, stop him. Do whatever you can. <laughs> um, I, I think that's obviously not the right choice, even if someone is going off, but that's how it goes. Um, fight or Flight. This one's also one of the uh, let's have everyone make choices cards. It's three and a white for an enchantment. At the beginning of combat on each opponent's turn, separate all creatures that player controls into two piles. Only creatures in the pile of their choice can attack this turn. So you basically make it so they can attack with only half their stuff. Yeah. I think these cards are not necessarily that powerful at their face value, but it does create for a lot of fun discussion around the table because anytime Factor Fiction and those sorts of cards come up, 
I'm always looking around being like, all right, what, what do we do that? here? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, it's not just me making the choice. And the next card is Chain of Vapor. It's blue for an instant, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Then that permanent's controller may sacrifice a land. If the player does, they may copy this spell and choose a new target for the copy. And then the next player can sack a land. Can land, and so it can just chain. By the way, in a stasis deck, what do you want your opponents to do? Right. You know, get rid of their lands. Yeah, and they're not going to have a lot to be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, But it, it could you know, go off in a way that's like, oh, sweet, we need to get rid of a lot of different things on the table. This mm -hmm. is a great way to do it because it's just non-land permanents. Uh, and the last one on the list is Manifold Insights. Two and a blue for a sorcery. Reveal the top 10 cards of your library. Starting with the next opponent in turn order, each opponent chooses a different non-land card from among them. Put the chosen cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So ostensibly, you get the worst 10, or sorry, worst four. Three cards. Three cards. Yeah. The worst three cards, good at math, Josh, out of your top 10 cards. But like you said, there's often instances where it behooves your opponent to give you specific things because there are answers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we need a board wipe. Okay, one of you can give me a board wipe out of my top 10 cards. Also, what if all of your cards, non-land cards are good? Yeah, hopefully they are if you built your deck right. <laughs> You're gonna get three cards. Yes, I think three man to draw three cards is still pretty good. And like sometimes you just, you're able to hit more stuff which is, I think, in general good. And this deck doesn't run too much in terms of mana rocks and stuff, so like duds. So I think Manifold Insights is a way to make at least it feel a little more fair like other players have more control in the game. You can also, knowing you have this card, you can make deals like, hey, uh, I'll do this for you, but you owe me a favor. Right, right, and right. And then right. when you play this, you go, remember that favor you owe me? Mm -hmm. I want that card. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a way to make the deck a little more interactive. Um, I think that's one of the easiest ways to get rid of the, oh my gosh, you're not letting us do anything part of the deck. The complaint that I think often comes up with Stasis is giving players chances to do more stuff. And I mean, if you're still playing Stasis and you play all these cards, I don't think it matters. That's true. <laughs> but it's a way to lessen the intensity, I think, of the deck. Um, and maybe make it a little more fun, especially if your play group is one that is really communicative and likes to talk a lot about these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and the other way to change the deck is Vorthos. And this is something that we rarely talk about on the show, but I decided to do a little deep dive into what's happening on Ravnica because we've been to this plane three, four times now. I don't even know how many. So it's story time, everybody, on the command zone. Okay, good, because I have no idea what's going on with the story. All right, so Josh... Um, you have a long day tomorrow, so we got to get you to sleep early. <laughs> After this, you're going to go to bed, bed, okay? Nap, oh, nap. this is my bedtime yeah, story? Yeah, it's bedtime story. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Mark Rosewater has uh, written a bunch of articles on what they wanted to do with the new uh, Ravnica set. And the biggest thing is that they wanted to find a place that they could do film noir, which I thought was really interesting. And they said they wanted a set that's occurring in darkness with shadows and moodiness. And five of the guilds of Ravnica have fallen to Bolas's influence now in the story. And those are all the guilds with Planeswalkers as representatives. So for Azorius, it's Dovin Bon. Um, now, originally, Ravnica had Detain and Forecast. Forecast is not really something you play in EDH. But Detain can be. Lavinia is a pretty good the original, card. Yeah, Lavinia from Return of Ravnica is good in a blink deck. Yeah. And the Azorius, as they're described in the story, are very protocol driven. They're bureaucratic. Um, they like to enforce the law and they're very formalistic. So that sort of matches along with what the deck already is trying to do. Um, so originally they had their own guild pact, which was just like a written document. And that didn't really end up working out. So Jace comes to the plane and eventually becomes the living version of the guild pack. So he's the one to establish order between all 10 of the guilds here because originally I think there was the Planeswalker Wars on Ravnica and when they left, there was just a bunch of creatures of all different types scattered around and they needed to find a way to unite them all together. And that's what Azor the Lawbringer okay. did. Now, when Jace left to do Gatewatch stuff, the, began, the balance became very tenuous and Esperia got killed by Vraska. And I didn't realize this, but the card Assassin's Trophy oh, yeah. is Esperia's like petrified face. And Vraska, and the Vla Vraska is this, the, the flavor text of that too. And Vraska, if you guys are keeping up with the story, has been mind wiped by Jace from their encounters on Ixalan to become an undercover agent for him essentially, and to convince Bolas that she's still on his side, but Jace will turn her at, a, I think he says, at a crucial moment. So I'm guessing- She's like his sleeper cell? Yeah, so I'm guessing that's actually gonna happen by the end of these three Ravnica sets. Right. Um, Dovin Bon, who you guys remember back from Kaladesh was running the Inventors Fair, uh, I think he was running it. He wanted to find out who made the planar bridge. It wasn't Tezzeret like he thought. It turns out, I think it is Nicol Bolas. So he ends up coming to Ravnica because Bolas is here trying to turn the guilds in his favor. And of course, 
He's weak-minded enough to be corrupted by Bolas. You got to be pretty strong-minded not to be corrupt, corrupted yeah. by Bolas. He's pretty much defeated every single yeah. member of the Gatewatch <laughs> yeah. and turned so many people to his side. He read a lot of books, is why. Yeah. Remember that Nicole, original art? Nicole Book Loss. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It was awesome. That joke just totally worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, more like a book win. Uh, so, Dovin Bond, Nickel Bolas was like, yo, Dovin, you like order and structure, right? Well, guess what? I will give you a chance to improve and fix the guild system to your liking because you think it's in disarray. And that's like Dovin Bond's, like, that's his thing. Um, and so, what he did is he started exploiting loopholes in the law in Ravnica, and he eventually in the chaos and disruption, like had some sort of stuff happen and he became the guild master. Okay. Um, That's why as Lavinia is not anymore. Yes. And that I believe now we, I don't, I, as of the time of recording this podcast, we don't know why Lavinia is in Azori's renegade, but she, her flavor text does hint. I told Jace that Ravnica would fall apart if he didn't take his responsibilities seriously. I didn't want to be right. So Ravnica is in the status of falling apart. Jace didn't take his responsibilities seriously enough because he's always planes walking out to do Gatewatch stuff. As a result, it appears that Lavinia is on the run while the new order has been established with Dovin Bond at the top of it. Um, and Dovin, actually, I like this part a lot. He started teaching the Azorius Guild how to make spy thopters and use precognition to arrest people before they committed the crime. Oh, it's minority report. It's minority report, yeah. yeah. So a Vorthos build for me, I think, if you wanted to take this in the Vorthos direction, Vorthos direction would tell the history of the Azorius from, on Ravnica from Azor the Lawbringer creating the Guild Pact all the way to how they started to fall into a darker influence in the next sets. So obviously, Vorthos cards you can add. add. Azor the Lawbringer is already in there. But, you know, he's sort of the one that created this all and bound everyone together and made the 10 guilds and gave them the roles. Grand Arbiter Augustine took over the guild pack in the moment of crisis, also in the deck already. And here's one we're starting to add more stuff. So Jace Belarin slash Jace, the living guild pact. That's pretty much a key element of the story. Um, and plus, if you're starting to put some of these bigger, crazier creatures in there, Jace the living guild pact is a great way to essentially get those guys out with his ultimate. Mm-hmm. Um, Esperia, Supreme Judge, was the guild master of Azorius after Jace was piecing out. Supreme Verdict is actually something that the Azorius guy said that he was going to do if something didn't happen. I didn't really read too deep on this. But it's also a great board wipe. So these are all powerful mm -hmm, cards mm -hmm. on their own, but they all fit within the theme. Uh, Lavinia of the Tenth was the Bailiff, and she's actually a card that has seen a lot of play in decks that can flicker her. Yep. Um, I think that's a mechanic you could add in here, being like, I will continually enforce the law, and then when Jace dies, maybe you're like, I can't do it anymore. Um, the new Dovin Bond, if there is going to be one, I believe there should be. It's been it's been revealed. It's been You're revealed. Good. You're good. Thank goodness. The new Dovin Bond. He's like, what can I talk about? What Don't can worry. I talk about? It's out there. Um, and to fit with the Dovin Bond theme, oh, we have. What are we talking about? This. Sorry, the way we're recording these podcasts is uh, because we've got scheduling things is a little bit ahead of time. Right. But the entire set has been spoiled for like a week and a half now for them. Oof, okay. great. Oh, that's right. Ugh. But the entire story, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. And we don't know about the story either. A lot of these elements were taken from flavor text. Actually. They don't give us all the story. They just let us see the cards a little early. But hey, if you guys like this Vorthos segment, maybe they could. Because <laughs> I, I actually had a lot of fun reading about the history. Um, and because Dovin has started to teach these guys how to do more insidious things, you can have the Thopter Spy Network, oh, which yeah. is a really fun card in there, as well as Telepathy. You get to see what's in everyone's hand. Oh, that's very minority order report. Yeah. Um, and of course, there is a whole uh, uh, wiki on the list of the secondary characters of Ravnica and the cards that are associated with them. So if you really want to get into the full Vorthos, na Vorthos nature of this, just check out that list and you can see all the cards. We're going to include the link in the show notes below. And of course, I like gonna... this next part. Yeah. <laughs> what to remove from the deck to make room for all this Vorthos stuff. And it's basically the mean things. The mean things mass land destruction, stacks elements, extra turns, counter spells. Unless you think that they really fit. Or you could choose, you know, there are more Azorius blue-white counterspells. Uh, again, there, there's one in this set as well. So you could put those in instead of, like, Pact Indigation. So that's sort of how I would do this deck if you didn't want to just be a pure stasis stacks, make everyone not like you. And kind of like what we saw with our Mizzic decks, not be able to play the deck very often. Yeah, true. Or at all. Just because you know what it's going to do and, it, and you've seen the reactions and it's not something that you necessarily want as a commander player. Well, and I would just say, if you have a Staxi ma Mass Land Destruction type of deck, you probably shouldn't play it a lot. 
because that's going to cause ire. Yeah. Your play group will probably deal with like once in a while the deck gets pulled out and they're like, okay, let's slog through this and let's all team up and try and get that person. But if it's just like game after game, they're going to start to hate it. Yeah. So it's the type of deck that can be very powerful and fun for you. And that's great. Uh, just don't overdo it is all I would say. Like as yeah, far as the amount of times you play it. Um, yeah. I like that precognition minority report thing i wonder what a deck that's just leans into that really hard it's like the azorius right now yeah uh that has like ponder preordain like you find every card that has like that idea of like precognition knowing what's gonna happen yeah, yeah. telepathy is a really good one soothsaying there's yep. like a bunch yep. of stuff that's like i'm gonna look into the future somehow that would be a fun deck to build dig through time is literally that yep yep so Play some ugin that guy travels through time all right so to the listeners what do you think of the lavinia deck what uh, would you play? What style would you play it with? Would you try something different altogether? And also, based on how Jimmy built his deck for game nights, how do you think it's going to do? You know Judith now. You know Lavinia. Uh, you can kind of imagine what the Nikia and the Tesa decks are going to be like, I think. And if not, maybe DJ's video about his Tesa deck will be out by now. If not, look for it soon. But we'd like to hear your predictions of, of you know, who's going to win this, you know, who's going to who's going to take down this next upcoming game nights again on January 25th. Yeah. And if you are interested in building this deck yourself, now's the time to order cards from cardkingdom.com using our affiliate link. All you have to do is add slash command zone to the end of it. And that's it. It takes nothing off of your plate, but it helps us make this show. It helps, you know, basically make sure we keep the lights on up here and you get some sweet cards from a great company. Yep. And they have great customer service. You got peace of mind that like your stuff's going to come fast. It's going to be in good condition. Yeah. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone. With great customer service. And then the other thing, the other sponsor we have for the show is Ultra Pro. They make all the so cool, cool themed products that protect your cards or make your battlefield look cool. They have awesome gravity dice. They have the Azorius, Gruul, Rakdos, Orzhov, Simic sleeves from Ravnica Allegiance. They also have all the theme sleeves that are from Guilds of Ravnica. So if you're building a Boros deck, I don't know why you would, but if you were, then you can find those sleeves as well. They have the deck boxes, also guild themed. They have the play mats. Really, if you want to make your battlefield look sweet, Ultra Pro has got you covered. And not just but this, not not just this set, but sets in the future as well. All right. Now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Have you seen either of these? No, but I'm very interested in the last one because that's something, that's a word that I don't think we've ever said in the podcast before. Okay, so there is a movie and it's called On the Basis of Sex. What? Yeah, it's not actually racy in any way as far as the movie itself. It's about <laughs> uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is the oh. famous United States Supreme Court justice. I think she was the second woman ever uh on this, you know, that was elected to the bench. Wishing her a speedy recovery? Yeah, she recently, I think it was her hip or something. She's like 86, 85 I think it was actually now. lung cancer elements. Well, no, they found the lung cancer because she had fallen oh. and broken her hip. So like falling and breaking, I don't know if it was her hip, whatever bone it was, yeah. was like a good thing because it caused her to undergo a bunch of diagnosis where wow. they found, I think she's battled cancer a couple of times now. She's quite the lady. Yeah, she has quite the history. Uh, and this is a, a movie that's just about her in the legal system, fighting to gain equality for women legally. Ah, uh, so that's on the basis of sex. I yes. Get it. So I get it's it. it's just it's a yes. Yeah, so the title is basically about the U.S. government being discriminatory in laws mm -hmm. on the basis of gender. Uh, Got you. And it was star and it's starring um what's the lady from Rogue One who was also in the Stephen Hawking movie. Uh, Felicity Jones. Oh, uh, Felicity, yes. Who's a very good actress. Uh, Army Hammer's also in it. There's, oh, I like Army a lot. Yeah, there's a bunch of... of the acting is very good. And I don't know, I sh you know, RBG, as she is called, is a polarizing figure. And I know we're going to get emails. We always do if we talk about anything. You know, it's this is a movie, right? Like, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that... I'm making no value judgments or whatever. But she is a very important person in the world, really in what she did for the fight to sort of gain equality for not just women, but just people of all kinds of diversities. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting how she went about legally uh, attacking the laws and, uh, and going into the courts and forming the arguments that would legally set up the world, the, the modern world we have today. Yeah, she, she is was a little bit like RGB, the, uh, the United States renegade, renegade a yeah. little bit. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, I like movies like that. I think it's well known that I like history and things yes. related to history and what we can learn from history or, or just people we can admire from the past who, you know, fought the good fight. And regardless of whether you agree with it, just did it in a in a really admirable way. 
So yeah. I don't know. I liked it. I didn't think it, the movie was like the most amazing movie, but from a from a standpoint of like telling a part Historical of a story, story that I didn't really know a ton about, like obviously know a little bit about her because she's currently on the Supreme Court, but like you know, I didn't I didn't know exactly you know every like little that. thing about her life. So I mean, I think stuff that is like I love Lincoln. Yep. Obviously, it brought a whole new flavor to that story, which I only kind of knew when I, I realized when I saw it. But the part that fascinated me about it was how he was able to deal with the legal system and right. the court system and the House and the Senate and all that to to get to the goals that he set out to accomplish, which I think is something that we can all draw inspiration from in terms of you have a goal. How are you going to set out and get that goal and accomplish it against overwhelming odds sometimes? Yeah, I think we live in this time right now, and it's unfortunate where like, Again, I know we're going to get emails because there's certain positions that Ruth has Bader Ginsburg has taken that people really don't like. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to endorse just by saying like, "Hey, I like this movie with this person, and I admire certain aspects about her." Doesn't mean that you endorse everything that person's ever done in their entire life, right? So you know, I'm just saying, just stop typing those emails right now because for one, you're not going to change anybody's mind, and for two, <laughs> like you know. Arguing on the internet. Yeah, who does exactly. That? Exactly. Okay. All right. All right. So Moving that's my to, message. I liked it. That was, I thought that was a very wholesome, nice message. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of something to say that's extremely divisive. Uh, well, there's these two guys, and they talk about a format. Oh, that, like, yeah. really, who plays this format? Like, Gosh. why aren't they just talking about Commander all the time? Because Commander's clearly the best format. Clearly the best. How dare we would speak about a podcast that's our sister podcast that Ugh. happens to cover another format called Modern. <sighs> Seriously. You know, maybe it's like a close, like, I would say close second, except there's so many things that are better than it. It's like a close eighth. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> a close eighth. <laughs> it's a photo finish for eighth place. <laughs> we're talking about, we're being facetious. We're talking yes. about our good friends, Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. They host a really, really great podcast called The Masters of Modern. The modern format is super complicated and as the years have gone by, because these guys have been doing it for like four plus years mm -hmm. now, the modern format is almost like twice as big as it was when they first started and keeping yes. track of like everything that's going on and then new sets come out and how that impacts this huge card pool that they've got and all the established decks in modern. Like it's hard for a person to keep tabs on and Alex and Ben can really help guide you through that whole thing. So as new sets come out like Ravnica Allegiance, if you want to know what cards are going to be played in modern and which, de which decks and which new decks maybe are more viable now because they got a vital piece that they didn't have yeah. before, Alex and Ben are the guys that you really want to check out. So just go onto YouTube, type in the Masters of Modern. You'll find them that way. They do have video. Or you find them on iTunes, Stitcher, right next to us at collected.company. You can also follow them on Twitter at the MMCast. I saw a modern GP on uh, Twitch the other day and Clark Clan Ironworks. Ooh. That card. The, the reason I like watching modern is because it does require a very high skill level to play these decks. And I think it was Ben Stark that said, I'm playing this deck because I think it's the most powerful. Even if I'm playing it 85 to 90% optimally, I'm learning new things about the deck as I go. I still think it's just that good that you, sh you should be able to beat the rest of the field. And you top eight at that GP, I think. So. I would say, too, that like if you watch a standard Pro Tour, there's very little that's going to happen, like interactions between cards that you can take into Commander and is right. useful. Modern has combos where you're like, Constantly. Oh, KCI combo that works in commander and is yep. very powerful like yep. those types of things so you can also learn a lot that you move into modern so listening to Alex and Ben the masters of modern can give you ideas that you can use in commander absolutely and our editor for the show is Murph, Murph. Josh Murphy special thanks to him for doing the editing I'm sorry Murph if you don't like us saying that your yeah. name that way well he's in the other stop. room I bet he hears us going Murph. and his eyeballs are rolling Murph, you have to look up the Earth sound. U R F F, I think is what it is from League of Legends. There's a, it's a manatee that yells it. So, <laughs> so it's not you. It's just it's not you. It's yeah. a manatee. But boy, <laughs> he, it's a great fun game mode. Um, eh, thank you, Murph. And as well, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer who make the cool living card animations, uh, as well as the ones that start and end the show with that awesome soul ring. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>